how has playing multiple instruments at once changed your drumming in those occasions when you're only playing the drums? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I just came back from a, a small run of, of gigs with Ben Wendell and um, Harish Raghavan and Taylor Eichstee. You know, it's hard music, but I've played it a bunch. Um, and uh, it's a really cool band. They're all, it just feels like playing with, you know, good old friends, you know. Um, but the point being, the first show, we didn't have a sound check. It was an outdoor venue. And uh, so, and and Ben Ben was supposed to be like set up in front of us on like a lower level on the stage. Um, but, uh, it would have looked too weird, you know, it's like, looks like a, like a, you know, should be like a salsa band or something if you do that. But the guy had been feeding, um, had been adjusting the monitors way down there, which was like 20 feet from Ben. So Ben was doing a sax solely and it started feeding back like crazy and nobody knew what was going on. Everybody's like, turn the sax down, turn the sax down. Nobody knew where it was. And then during during the song when we're all playing like I was like I was telling the guy to like come up and we had a whole conversation about like I think the problem is that it's feeding back down there. And then he's like no I unplugged it and I was like no I'm pretty sure that that's feeding back and that Ben can't hear himself in his actual monitors. You turned him off in my monitors, but it's feeding back back, back down there. And he's like I'll turn it I turned it off, but I'll go check. And he unplugged it and then. There was no sound on stage, so I was. Able so you had to the have extra part of your brain yeah, available. Yeah, so I was able to have a, a full conversation while like comping for a solo on hard music. So that's how my brain has changed. Is that I, I can really do two things at once now, like parallel kind of. <laughs> but also, um, just playing drums by itself, it it feels like it doesn't take up as much room. And it doesn't mean that I'm any better at the drums. In fact, you know, I always want to be better at the drums than I am. Everybody does. But uh, it just doesn't feel like it occupies the whole space anymore. It feels like there's a lot more room. Do you feel like you leave more space or do you feel like you're more conscious of where the other instruments are? Or were you already kind of thinking that way? I don't think it changed. I think I'm a little more relaxed <clears throat> when I play because there's less like processing that has to happen, you know? So I think there's just more room for other stuff, but um, but yeah, I, my, I don't think the actual playing has changed that much. I think it's just I'm maybe more relaxed now. So we were talking before we hit record about the home studio, the beautiful home studio behind you there. Thank you. So yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And I'm jealous as like the apartment dweller where I've got this thing, if anyone catches a whiff of any drums, it's, it's bad. So I have to share a, a studio space. So respect to you sir but this is all i ever wanted so you've arrived yeah and then you'll you'll never leave now right it's gonna take a zombie apocalypse exactly yep no yeah we're, we'll be here forever how how would you say your time is portioned between your solo projects and stuff like four and just scratching the creative itch given that you're in the studio and gigs, tours, other people's music. Yeah, I'm also a father of a two-year-old, two and a half, two and a oh, half year old. So that is really 97% of the time. And then the other 3% is split between mastering, playing drums for other people, and four. Um, and I would say that it's pretty much even between all of those. Uh, I master probably two records a week two records and a few singles, maybe a week. And then, uh, you know, I try to, I try to set aside time to be creative. Uh, usually I don't practice drums that much on their own unless I have like a tour coming and I want to sound my best. Uh, otherwise I try to sit down on the four kit, which is this kit back here, which has, it always has the synths. It always has the four stuff set up and I have guitars hanging on the wall over here. And I just try to improvise every day and record it and, uh, you know, work on shedding like melodic minor scales on the guitar while I'm playing like a funk beat with the right hand kind of thing. So that's when I'm being creative, <clears throat> um, that's generally what I'm doing. I'm generally like workshopping with this, this uh, monstrosity. Uh, and, uh, but you know, it's, it's, I don't get to do it every day, um, you know, a few times a week for an hour or two. And then if I have a gig, 
or something, I make it a priority. Um, but I'm just about to go to China for the first ever Montreux Jazz Festival that they're having in Shanghai. And I'm doing a four gig there. And then uh, I was going to go teach in Switzerland as four, but then I got called to open for Snarky Puppy again on their tour in um, in the States. And it just worked out perfect. So I was able to sub out the Switzerland thing and go play 10 dates with Snarky. So these next two weeks, actually, it's going to be mastering records, uh, tracking stuff for people that I told I would track stuff. I can't push it off any longer. They're like, no, I need the tracks now. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Um, and then preparing for the, the, the four tour by, you know, rehearsing what I already have and working on some other new music that I have ideas for. And then also next week, we're making a knee body record. So it's a lot to do in two weeks, but that's, uh, that's how my time is portioned. <laughs> that's crazy. You're making me feel lazy. <laughs> I've spent two days trying to upload a single podcast episode. <laughs> Well, no, but I, I have those too. I still have those things, but um, now there's just other things going on while I'm trying to do something like that. You know, it's like I'm doing that, but then I'm also shopping for groceries and like putting my, you know, giving my daughter a bath, you know? So it's, it's the same. You can keep being creative. It's just like, I get a lot of my best work done while I'm doing dishes, like in terms of like, you know, writing music or you know, thinking conceptually about things, you know, it's like I, m most of my best creative work is like away from the instruments now because it just has to be. Does most of the writing for four happen that way, either emergently as you're just sitting practicing the setup or when you're doing dishes or bathing your daughter as opposed to you set aside time and like now I'm going to write for four? Yeah, now it is. It used to be where I would just improvise for like an hour and I was like, oh, a minute two, a minute 36 are cool. That's an A and a B section. Boom, sandwich. That's a song. Uh, but now it's a lot of things like, oh, if it was this kind of vibe and like I have to think about what I can and can't do physically. And part of the fun of the project for me is trying to reconfigure those, um, those uh, limitations all the time. You know, so thinking about, oh, yeah, so if I did a song where it's like, you know, a, a stacked 11s, it's a low bass note and a stacked 11 and they're all parallel. And then I can play a solo with this hand of the guitar. And so I'm thinking about stuff like that. And then just like, oh, how would that go? And then sync something into my phone. And so, yeah, most of the writing is done like, yeah, doing yard work or dishes or whatever, for sure at this point. And does that feel like the thing that you finish the other stuff so that you can go do? Or does it ever feel like, oh, I've got that hanging over my head? Well, um, yeah, I mean, this is what I... I you know, if I had a choice, I would just do four most of the time. Um, but I, I like doing other stuff too. Um, and of course, yeah, just like yard work and, and, and dishes and stuff like that. That's just like tending to the farm. You know, we have a farm now, basically it's a house. So, and a, and a child. So it's like just all that stuff has to get done. It just has to. So, you know, uh, you know, my wife can only do t so much. And, uh, so, uh, and she's a working musician too. She's a working bass player. So, so we're both kind of just like passing, passing the baton, like every few hours, like, okay, you got me Lou for if I got a gig coming up. I got to practice for, and you know, so, um, yeah. So, so that's the deal. It's chaos, total chaos. Yeah, I understand. So I had a question about how your practice has changed since the last time we spoke in 2016. And I think you've kind of answered that already, but, the segue from there is something that just occurred to me when I was like journaling this morning to try and think of what to ask you about. And I just want to lay this on you. Assuming you agree with the statement, some drummers continue to sound fresh even as they age and others lose their edge more quickly. And without naming names, what do you think the difference is? Um, I think it's a couple things. It's like you st some people stop being challenged mentally or uh, uh, or just in terms of, you know, they get really good and then either the gigs get easier and they pay better. And then it's like, yeah, you're just doing an easier gig that doesn't really meet your criteria of difficulty or, or intellectual stimulation. This happens a lot with drummers that get really good and then they get a gig that pays, you know, five figures a week, which is unusual now. It didn't used to be unusual. 
and it might not be as stimulating for them, you know, so they don't really care to push any further because like, why would you like the goal is to get a job that, you know, where you can make a six figure salary as a musician, which is pretty unusual these days. So why would you push past that? In the past, I saw it happen when people moved from New York to LA. Uh, certain jazz drummers of your uh, kind of fell off in terms of their fire and stuff like that when that happened. Though that's not the case anymore because now LA is really cool and super energetic and there's a lot of great music happening there and a lot of people pushing the envelope. So that's changed. Um, but I think that's really what it is. It's, it's, it's losing ways to challenge yourself. And for me, it's like, I just get bored easily. Um, not because I think I'm great or anything, um, but just because I just need to be stimulated like a little kid needs to be stimulated, you know, like a little kid can only play with the same puzzle so many times before they're like, okay, I know this puzzle, it's time to move on. And, you know, <clears throat> not to say that there isn't a beauty in playing like, just like, dun, dun, da, da, dun, dun, like just that every night, 300 nights a week or 300 nights a year, that's beautiful too. And really, 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 really hard to do. But for me, it has to be something else. It has to be more. So for, yeah. So this, the four thing is, is the thing that really keeps this just going crazy all the time because it's, it's too hard. The, the four, four is just really hard to do. So it's, it's kind of like, if I don't work on it, you know, I could die on stage. It just sound, it could sound really bad. So uh, but I think that's the difference is, is not being stimulated, you know? Yeah, I feel that. Yeah. So I got a question about knee body. Okay. Did you realize what you had when the band started to get some traction, maybe 2013, 2014? And I remember seeing you guys at Shapeshifter around that time, like right after the line came out. Could you feel at that moment that you'd creating, created something really unique that would basically influence a whole generation of musicians? Well, that's really nice. Thanks. Um, I actually thought that year was 2005. Um, that was the year where I really felt felt like, man, it's cranking. Like that was those were the first years where I would come to New York and I would feel like, oh, I'm actually like a musician. Like because I, I, when I would be in L.A. like walking my dog, basically all year, and it's like the weather's the same. And then anybody would go do a gig here and there. People would dig it, but it was always just like, what the hell are these guys doing? And the rest of the year I was doing like film soundtracks and playing like pop gigs and kind of unfulfilled and kind of just like, hey, what you know, working on my own music and practicing and all that stuff, but I didn't feel like it was part of a community. 2005 was the period where um, we started playing in New York and people were losing their minds, at least in my mind. That was the first time I'd played for audiences, this kind of music where people were super stoked. Uh, and then there was, yeah, there was a little bit of a lull there for a few years just based on, you know, the record label stuff and all that stuff. So I never, th to me, like, 05 was the peak. <laughs> and then, yeah, 2014, like, the line was cool because it was a bigger, slightly bigger label. It was Concord and stuff like that. Um, but I never really honestly thought that we influenced anybody. It just seemed like the natural progression of how music should go, like, of how jazz should go. And there are bands that sound like us, but I don't know if it's because they listen to us, honestly. It just seems like, well, it's the obvious choice, you know? Like, you just put these new sounds together, and that's what jazz is going to be, you know? So, uh, thanks. I'll take that as a compliment. Sure. Yeah, I guess there could have been some things happening in parallel. And, of course, this is anecdotal, and and I'm basing it a lot on my own experience. But I feel like, so, like, yeah, 2013, 2014, the line comes out, like, I see you guys live. I I get obsessed with that record and start playing along with it and playing a bunch of covers and, like, digging deep into the catalog. And, like, YouTube's starting to become a thing, so I'm starting to see all the live knee body stuff. And then, like, 2015, 2016, the 8020 channel starts to get, like, a little bit bigger, and I start to, like, hang out with other drummers so, so I'll run, you know, I would go to LA to go to, to NAM and, and run into other drummers. And the amount of times that Kneebody and you were like on somebody's tongue, uh, started to like catch my attention. Like, oh, these guys are like low key influencing a lot of people. So that's interesting. That's cool. Thanks. I mean, a lot of the people that I really like are like that. You know, like I always thought like Wayne Krantz was hugely in influential. As was like Tim Lefebvre and Keith Carlock, and Keith is really famous, but they're all kind of low-key influential. You know, they're like, all three of those guys are like 
complete game changers on their instruments and for the genre, but they don't, none of them really get the props that they should, <laughs> to be honest, in that way. So, um, but thanks, that, that, that means a lot. I wanted to say, by the way, congratulations on your show. Um, I love it. I totally watch it and uh, it's, it's great. So congrats. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. It's awesome. Let's pivot to talking about something else I've been obsessed with lately, which is flow states when we're playing. How do you manage the self-critical voice so that it's on when you need it, but not bothering you during, say, performances? Yeah. It's never really on anymore. Um, it's just that, like, uh, you know, the way that kids learn and the way that they absorb information is is through not being critical with themselves. It's by repetition until they understand something or it feels right to them. And uh, that's the way that I try to approach music. And I really had a realization like a week or two ago when I couldn't sleep about the poisonous aspect of social media and screens and the phone and being just kind of like trapped in this feedback loop of everybody talking about each other and people talking about themselves and all that stuff. And realizing that it kind of brings out the worst qualities of American capitalism and makes people feel worse about themselves and uh, makes that, that critical voice higher, more, you know, sharp and grating because part of America's the success in America is by fighting against that critical voice and, and, you know, succeeding. But for me, I realized, yeah, it's not healthy. Uh, the healthy thing is to just have a quiet mind, a peaceful garden, and to create from that state. So once I realized that, uh, it was just a couple of weeks ago, but I've been a lot happier since then. Um, and uh, so I, but I've, I was already doing this when I played, especially when I played and when I practiced, is just approach it like a child approaches it. Just really just do it. Uh, and your body and your brain and your ears will organize it all for you. And the thing that I noticed is when your brain starts creeping into it, and you never want your brain to creep into it ever. If your brain is creeping into it, it's probably because you're not breathing enough. It's really simple, but it's like, if you find that like, oh, super certain tempos, I'm like, I'm starting, I start to stress out at certain tempos, you're probably not breathing. So if you just tell yourself to take a deep breath and just focus on your breath, then usually you're like, why does this even matter? It's just the drums. Who cares about the drums? The drums are not important in the grand scheme of things. Who cares about the drums? If there are no drummers on the earth tomorrow, it's not really going to change anything. So, you know, if you think about it that way, then it's really just your own self pursuit of happiness. And then it's, it's kind of easier to, to live in that flow state all the time. But the flow state really is, it comes from breathing. And it also, the way that Jack DeJanet describes it is the best. The way he does it is he imagines he's a being floating over himself, watching himself play. And that's the flow state. And that's the state you want to be in all the time. And he's always in that state when he plays. You can hear it. You can even see it. Um, he's floating over the stage. And he can fix everybody's mess because he can he can see, you know, oh, the bass player didn't hear that transition. Or, you know, he can, he can just hear it because he has that outside perspective. That's really interesting. I feel like to, to, to delve into my experience with with playing a little bit i feel like i want the critical voice on if i'm trying to make a skill better and i want it off if i'm creating but but i wonder if it's a level thing like maybe you're just beyond the point where you have to even worry about the stuff i have to worry about <laughs> i don't think it is i really think it's just i really think that that's what maturity is telling you to do and i just think that's the wrong move <laughs> because i got better so much faster when i was a kid and i just felt i just fe i never like i never really did we've talked about this before but i didn't really do transcription work or like i didn't really do a lot of studying stuff i more just felt my way through stuff you know like oh that feel felt that feel felt good I'll do that again. Or that didn't feel good. Why didn't it feel good? Oh, it's because, you know, my eighth notes suck or whatever. And then you can isolate those things, you know? Like I, I have been working a lot on my right foot uh, just to get it locked up with my right hand and, and have it not pull away tempo-wise. It's something that I've been working on. 
Uh, but I just isolate it and work on it in a non-critical way, in a rep repetitive way, because you really don't have to tell yourself, like, line up every time you play the drums. You don't have to tell yourself that. It's just going to do that if you're listening, because the ears are the biggest brain you have, you know, as a musician. It's like you're reacting to your ears. You don't have to do anything else. The ears are going to tell you everything you need to know. So Interesting. Uh, so if you just isolate those things, and for me, if I'm just sitting at the table, just working on like, you know, lining up all the limbs of my body so that nothing rushes or drags, uh, then when I get on the kit, you know, I feel that it's better and it's, but then I don't think like every time you hit the bass drum, it's got to be with the hi-hat, you know, you just, you just listen to it, you know, another yeah. thing too, a couple other things, uh, posture, huge, sitting up straight with your chest out and sitting on the back of the throne. That's another big one because it allows you to breathe better. It's like singing, apparently. Uh, it allows you to 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 breathe better, which makes your brain work better. And it's just like when you're talking to people or walking around, it's like if you have better posture, you have more energy because you have better breath. It's the same thing. So all those things can allow you to be in a better flow state, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's what I think anyway. I mean, I could be wrong, but that's that's how I'm doing it now. And the thing that makes it work is that it makes me happier and for me it's I've, I've noticed that like if you're happier then you'll want to work on it more so last time we talked you were talking about the practice gigging dichotomy and you used the analogy of pottery where like practices say sculpting a new arm and under the pressure of gigging it's like firing it and i i do think that that hints that there's there's a bit of a difference there. And I think you were alluding to the sonic differences, but, but I think there might be, and tell me if I'm wrong, like even more sort of abandon in a performance situation. Well, there is, there's Maybe, adrenaline yeah. you're playing with. I'm really sensitive to energies of people and audiences and all that stuff. So I'm definitely playing to the room, the, the feeling of the audience. I can feel when there's a person in the front row who's keyed in. You know, like, especially with four, I could feel like I was doing a sound check with Snarky the other day and it was like the janitor came up and just stood there and I was like, this guy's listening to everything. I can tell. I can tell that he's listening to every note. And then it just made it really easy. I'm like, oh, I'm just singing to you, you know. Um, but that's the kind of feedback loop that you don't have when you're playing by yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's just a layer of, of, uh, of importance missing, you know. I, I talked about it with Mark Juliana a little bit, actually. We did this Gretsch night thing together, and he was talking about – he has a whisp whisper room now and mic a microphone set and stuff like that. And he was just talking about, like, how do you get that same intensity, like, playing by yourself? Like, because I have to do all the four stuff by myself, you know? And how do you get the same intensity, like, doing that as you do when you do a show? And, like, I'm like, I can't. It's impossible. I figured you could. And he's like, no, I can't do it either. So it's just like, there's that thing about playing live where it just, it just changes the whole adrenaline rush. And then also when you're playing with people, like if I have like Tim Lefebvre, like firing away on my left hand side, it's going to change how I feel time as opposed to if it's just me playing, you know? So that's part of the hardening process too, is somebody else like moving things around a bit, you know, and you have to react to it. So. And other people reacting to you. Yeah, exactly. Right. So everybody's reacting to each other and that's kind of it's kind of hardening things in a way by making them yeah flex more flexible and more firm i don't know it's hard to explain maybe let's segue to greenblatt then because that was something i was thinking about when i was playing it was i i wanted to do something where i felt spontaneous and creative and then if there wasn't anything where i really cracked over something I wanted to just dust it off and, and post it. And sure enough, when I listened to it after four or five, six times, there were little things that started to creep out that annoyed me a little bit. Like, oh, I rushed this thing a little bit and then it felt a little jittery before I, I got back into the, the ostinato. But I, I think maybe I've been creeping up on something like you're talking about just where, you know, I was talking to Richard about this too, where there's kind of this uncanny middle of learning a tune where at the beginning, as you say, everything's new and novel. So you're approaching it kind of like a kid. And then you listen to a couple takes, then you go in for that next, or I do, 
<laughs> I go in for that next take and I'm like, don't fuck this thing off that I fucked up on the, the last take. Like, make sure this is perfect. Make sure that's perfect. So then it's like a really self-conscious performance. And then after a couple of months of living with it, maybe, maybe playing it, touring with it or something, then you have it deeply ingrained, but it's from like a less self-conscious spot, right? Yeah, I mean, God, it's it's such a such a deep web of 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 uh, agreements with that statement. Um, it's you know, all my favorite players. It sounds like they never thought about that stuff. You know, it sounds like they just played because they're so good and didn't worry about being self conscious. You know, like anytime you see Tony Williams play, it's just like full. You know, it's just full on. He's a very smart guy who's incredibly gifted at the drums. And he just gives it his all and damn the torpedo, damn the torpedoes. But he also, you know, played the drums in a less self-conscious time where there were less genres and there was less grid and there was less metronome and all that stuff. So that's kind of changed our perception. So yes, sometimes part of it is just learning to live with the flaws and maybe thinking, oh yeah, like later listening back and being like, actually, I like that flaw, you know? And part of it is just learning to trust that, like, I think this sounds good enough, you know? Um, but you have to go through that period of, like, extreme anguish of listening back to yourself and being like, oh, I hate this. And breaking down why that is, you know, and not letting it get you down, you know? I mean, if that happens to you, you know, it does, it can happen to people. Um, and then, yeah, there, you just have to kind of work through it, um, I guess, just by recording yourself and listening back all the time. And then, you know like you said like you would be like oh next time i better not screw this up and that could be a myriad of things that could be like i missed the hit because i didn't know the song very well or it could just be i rushed that figure and it's a simple figure but i rush it every time and there's no way you're going to fix it until you practice it you know i mean you might be able to be like lay back here but then you know you're kind of driving on like a, a course at that point you're not really like allowing yourself to be creative so it's just a tricky dance but Really, the whole point of practicing all the time and playing all the time is just so that you can quiet all this and just play, you know? I feel like that's what, you know, like Dan Weiss is working towards. He still practices like he's 17 or whatever, you know? And he's just, I mean, he already sounds like he's hes quieted all this stuff, but I think he's probably just working towards that, like, ultra zen state where you just kind of transcend, you know? Baby steps. I'm, I'm, I'm inching my way toward it. Well, do you have any specific feedback on Greenblatt? No, it sounded great to me. Uh, I just, I, it sounds, you sound so much better than you used to. Oh, thank and it's you. really interesting. I was thinking about how just the, the sound of drums and the touch has really changed since the internet. Ooh, tell me more. Well, okay. So I have a drumstick here. Uh, you, you seemed more like a, like a little bit more like a this player before and like kind of a, like a wetter sound, you know, like the way that I imagine the, the popular way that people used to play in terms of a synthesizer envelope, do you know synthesizers very well? No, but I, I ca I'm kind of tracking what you're saying. So there's the ADSR, which is attack, decay, sustain, release. Like any <clears throat> any analog synth will have ADSR. And before it was like the attack was like boom, and then it kind of there wasn't a lot of decay. It was like it sustained kind of right away. It was like a a transient, but it wasn't as big. It was there was a lot more sustain. Now the way people are playing is huge attack very quick decay and the sustain is lower and 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 what that gets you is a punchier sound that's not as loud for as long so you can actually it's more hip hop is what it is really um uh but you can you can play kind of louder and punchier without running over the music you know uh which works really well for playing you know beats with jazz groups or you know just sounding punchy but not sounding loud which i found really hard to do with like this kind of molary fulcrum here kind of thing so uh, i don't know if you're doing this but i switched to this like three years ago like the tony grip um, yes for everything except for like quick singles and doubles exactly and any kind of loud playing it's mostly back fulcrum yeah. yeah so that's what it sounds like it sounds like you didn't do that before but now it's like oh that's that sound now everybody's doing it <laughs> it's a better way to play the drums i think i mean it's like that's the sound i always wanted and uh, it took until I was 40 years old to find it. So now, hmm. you know, every 15 year old can play like that. <laughs> it's just, I didn't have the information. Yeah. I wish I did because it would have saved me so much time of like, just why can't I get the sound I want, you know? Yeah. Um, so, but it sounds great. It sounded great to me. Um, yeah. And I'm so, I'm so stoked that you have cymbals now that sound good. 
Congratulations. Do you have a drum deal yet? I don't. I feel like you could get a drum deal. There's a, there's a particular manufacturer that I reached out to. Okay, um, is it Tama? No, no. But, but I, I even asked um, for an intro to them. Uh, and, and I told them honestly, like, I'm not reaching out to anybody because just the way with, it was with the symbols, like, I'm not just looking for a deal, any deal, like, I've, I, whenever I can choose, I want to play you guys. Yeah. And he got back to me. He, he was very nice about it. Uh, but he just, we haven't had time to connect. So like, I'm kind of low key going after that, but I also don't have a practice space where I can even keep my own drums. So I'd love to have it, but it's, I guess it's not like a burning priority. Yeah. Yeah. It would, it would, you know, it would just feel better probably to have great drums or whatever, but um, yeah, I mean, that's all I've ever done with endorsements too, is like, what's the thing I like the best and then just play that. Um, so luckily all the companies have been cool as well. So I've been really lucky. Yeah. That's great. But yeah, that's the way to do it. I mean, if you like go f head on into like a symbol company, you just hate the symbols, then you're just stuck with them. You know, <laughs> it's a drag. Well, it makes it so much easier to be a representative of the brand to if you just ambiently love the sound because you're going to want to share it. Yeah, exactly. That's 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 the only way to do it, because then you can. Yeah, you can genuinely be like, I play this because it's the best and that's the way it is, you know. I want to circle back to something you were mentioning, because I did have a question written down, like, do you feel like social media has been a net positive or negative for drums? And earlier in the conversation, you were extolling all the negatives. No, it's been a net positive for sure. I mean, there, the negatives are just the psychological aspect of what, like I talked about with um, just kind of losing yourself a little bit to this demon of a of a device that's trying to steal your soul and it will steal your soul in terms of the information you can find it's great couldn't be better and the drummers are better than they've ever been in history and it's really it's, it's insane it's just insane especially drums because drum, there's something about drums that's like more similar to video games or something it's like in terms of how the cool factor and the hand-eye coordination factor and also just like when you're a kid you can pick up so many physicalities about the instrument quicker than you can if you're older. So for a kid who's on social media, they're just like, oh, that's JD Beck. I can do that. You know, you know, not many people can play like JD Beck, but I'm saying like just having that exposure and seeing like some young kid just like shredding, melting faces, uh, it just makes it possible. And then they just learn how to do it. You know, it's like, okay, you could play Fortnite for 12 hours a day, or you could just shed the drums, you know? So I think it's been, Amazing. The only thing that I notice is that people are starting to sound exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. Which is, but that's just the same with food, with food too. It's like now you can go to any city in the world basically and get the same food. I mean, it's like, okay, you know, the, you know, the, the sushi will be better in Tokyo, you know, and the Mexican food might be worse, but you can still get everything. So it's the same thing. It's just globalization kind of making everything a little bit more unified. And so, now the trick is just to figure out ways to, you know, I don't know, find, find your bliss, I guess. Yes. And, and to be an individual. And by the way, like I was very conscious when I was reaching out to people I wanted to speak to for this podcast, practically everybody is somebody who sounds very unique and kind of created their own idiom. And when you hear a couple bars of them, it's it's unmistakable, but I feel like the paradox there, at least from practically everybody I've talked to, is nobody was that self conscious about creating their own style. They sort of did it did it emergently just by following what they liked, which leaves me with the conundrum of, well, what if I just follow what I like and I end up sounding like everyone else? And that's really the man. Yeah, it's. You know, there's no, and I, I, I didn't even mean to say that as a criticism because. No, I didn't take it that way. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I, but I, I'm, I'm trying to think of how I would have an answer for that because, you know, I was, I was listening to Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers yesterday on the way home. Way home, I forgot which record it was, and Art Blakey, man, he's just playing the drums like he's going to kill somebody. But also, I mean, it's unbelievable. It's so good. But also, he's just so Tony, like. Tony got so much stuff from Art Blakey, like his press rolls, single stroke rolls, like foot stuff, the way like Art does foot stuff is very like Tony. So I was like, yeah, you know, how, 
you know, I, so I started just looking around for, you know, Tony influences. And of course, there's only like 10 drummers he could have been influenced by because it was so young in the instrument, you know. And this is part of when guys like older generation are like, yeah, you got to learn everything. You know, it's like, well, everything now is a million times more than everything was in the 1950s. You only had 20 years of music to listen to and you only knew about music from America. Now we have a hundred years of music from the entire world. So we're supposed to learn all that, you know, like, but anyway, point being there's, I read, found an article. It was, I think it was on like, you know, a PAS website or something where he was like, yeah, I used to get every record that Max Roach was on, Art Blakey, Philly Joe, Roy Haynes. And he would learn every note, not just the solos, but the, you know, the comping and then try to figure out why they played that, you know? And it's like, but Tony is the most original drummer maybe ever, you know, but he really does. If you go back and listen to those guys, he does sound like Roy and he does sound like, you know, Art Blakey and he does sound like Alan Dawson. You know, it's just that he he did so much work and he he ate so much. <laughs> he learned so, like so much language that when he speaks, the sentences are his own, you know. So I think I think if he could just keep falling down the rabbit hole and being like, oh, man, I like that guy's fill and I like that guy's fill and I like that guy's fill. Then you put them all together and then you find that it is kind of your sound. And then. Then Wendell actually said this in a clinic once that people started saying he had his own sound when he stopped being self-conscious about sounding like other people. In other words, when he stopped, so he stopped fighting so hard to sound like himself. Yes. When he stopped fighting his influences and just playing what came naturally, then people were like, man, you got your own sound. So that's kind of like reverse psychology in a way, but I think that's true, you know? So whereas like I did very little transcription work, I mostly just listened and kind of approximated what I thought stuff was. Um, but, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would do it the way Tony did it. Because <laughs> I think that is a better way to do it. So I think that, you know, when you see people playing the same way, part of it is just the language changes. Like, you know, Elvin and Tony was a language shift, you know, and, and Jack, I'll put Jack in there too. That was a language shift away from Philly Joe, you know. Uh, and there was no social media then. It was just like things were progressing. This era of Instagram drummers and just all the, the way the drummers play live and people are playing at the back of the hand, it's a language shift away from like, you know, the more, more molary players of, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So it's just an ever evolving thing. But I think if you just dive down the rabbit hole and, and you play long enough, if you put enough hours in, you'll just sound like yourself. I'm so I, if, once you get me going on these things, I won't stop, but I, I felt that way about the Kenny G movie. I don't know if you saw the Kenny G movie. No. Is it good? I loved it. Oh. Yeah, I learned a lot about music. Um, I, I don't think he's like the greatest sax player ever, but he's played the instrument so much that when he plays it, there's an undeniable strength to it. Like you see it in the movie. It's like there's a strength of intent there that sounds like him, even if it's out of tune or he's he's not making a, a, a passage that he's practiced six hours in front of the TV too quickly and he's never broken it down correctly, there's still a depth there because he's played the instrument so much. So I think if you just do that, if you just play the instrument so much, then there's something undeniable there. You know, it's like a, it's, it's the idea behind chanting and stuff like that. If you just do something repetitive enough, it becomes something deep, you know? You, you mentioned movies and that got me going about the, the movie that obviously hangs over all drummers like a Paul ever since whatever, 2014. And it, it leads me to ask, is, is dues paying worth anything? Is, is, there, is there any value a musician gets from going through a crucible where they're on stage at Smalls or Cleopatra's Needle and people are, are looking down their nose at them saying, no, that ain't it. Like you're, you're dragging, you're rushing. Yeah, no, I mean, First of all, music, jazz music at that point was so culturally important. It was like such a big turning point in, in, you know, everything in America. And it was such a large point of pride in terms of like an export of America and all that stuff at that point. Back to your question, I don't think that that kind of behavior is relevant anymore in terms of just being negative ever to people musically. And I've noticed this, like I did those Taylor Hawkins shows you know, uh, where I played guitar on those those big dedication shows and everybody there, the biggest pop stars in the world, they were all so nice. <laughs> no, no vibe, no vibe from anybody. Everybody was super nice and approachable and just like 
familial. And that's different than it used to be, you know? It's like the rock scene certainly wasn't like that in the 70s and 80s. And part of it was drugs and part of it was ego and part of it was the self-importance, you know? But uh, there's no drugs. Uh, nobody cares about music anymore. And uh, there can't be ego because there's so many nice people that can take your job that do it better than you and they're nice. So, yeah, I really don't think paying dues in that way has anything to do with anything. I do yeah. think the, the way that you pay dues is that you just play a bunch of gigs that don't pay great um, because you want to get a bunch of time on the instrument, um, but not at the expense of your happiness or your well-being, you know. So, And now, you know, like we talked about this last time, I remember, but it, now it, it really depends on what your goal is, you know, like uh, your goal might be to tour nine months a year with bands. So if you want to do that, then yeah, you got to get good at playing with people. You know, if your goal is to make a YouTube channel and get really good at the drums at the same time and like, you know, make make a comfortable living just making content, that's just as noble a goal, you know, like there's no there's no there's no difference between the two. It's just what you want to do, you know, what you want to put your time into. So, you know, and I applaud you for, for going head on to into that early, you know, and making a, a compelling product. Um, it's congratulations. I don't know if I, I would have the patience to do something like that, but um, uh, I think, I think it's great. And it's like, you know, it's like kind of a more valuable resource in a certain way because people can just, always have access to this information as opposed to like, you know, when's, uh, when's Mark Juliana in town? Okay. Like he's playing 2000 miles away next spring. Like let's book it. You know what I mean? You, you value that because it's scarce. Like, yeah. Cause it's scarce. Right. Yeah. And because you want to be in the room with people, you know, like getting to see like Brian Blade be in the same room with Brian Blade and hear what his symbol sound like from 10 feet away is different than hearing it on the internet. You know, mm -hmm. it's a valid thing, but they're both, they're both super valid. Well, that's a, that's a great note to end on. Where would you send people who want to check out your latest stuff and learn more about you? Um, I would say just Instagram, Nate Wood Music Instagram, and then Nate Wood Music YouTube. And then I have some, um, some of my songs on the ground up uh, YouTube as well. And I just put out a thing on Korg that's not very drummy, but uh, it's, you know, chill, ambient, cool. And then uh, I have a record coming out with Trio Grande, which is a uh, Will Vinson and Gilad Hexelman. And that record's going to, it's a band. It's officially a band. And uh, that, we did a tour last November and it was incredibly fun. Those guys are both absurdly good at their instruments and very low drama, which is very important to me. Um, I, I, I don't like being on the road with like people who are negative or have big egos. So those guys are both just great to tour with and the music was really good. So we made a record. It's going to come out in November and we're going to start doing a bunch of touring. And I play drums and bass at the same time. Galad plays guitar and, uh, you know, plays some low octave stuff. You know, he's an octave pedal on his two lower strings. And then we'll play sax and Rhodes at the same time. So it's kind of like a pinch hitter band. We're all kind of switching all the time. Trio Grande. Yeah, Trio Grande. And then you know, a new Knee Body record, but we're going to record next week and it's going to be amazing. Um, I don't know. It's going to be fun. And then uh, yeah, that'll be out next year. Amazing. Well, this has been this has been great. Uh, had, a, had a great time the first time we talked. I um, feel like it's been a hot minute since we caught up, but it's it's been great hearing about all you've got going on and swapping thoughts. So really, really appreciate your time. Cool. Yeah, good to talk to you.